Now, we have been talking about, this is a, just a, a smidgen uh, loud, Stan, just a smidgen. We have been uh, talking about the 12 apostles and uh, who replaced Judas. And of course, we saw this morning that Matthias is the one, the only one that was qualified. However, there was someone else that was qualified, just as qualified as uh, Matthias. And uh, it wasn't James the Just. He had just become a believer, and he was a very young babe in Christ. Nor was it the Apostle Paul, but Paul wasn't even saved yet. But there was another, another fellow by the name of Barnabas. Now, we find him actually under three names in Acts chapter 1, verse number 23, he was one of two. Matthias was the first, and then Barnabas. Verse 23 says, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice. Now, you just wonder uh, what these guys answered to when they were called to supper. I mean, just, just about anything. Uh, because uh, they had so many names, uh, they uh, uh, didn't know what to do. Now, we're going to see that this fella actually gets one more name. Chapter 4, and verse number 36. And it says, and Joseph, you will recall that the very first name that we read there with regard to uh, uh Barsabas was Joseph. This is simply the shortened Greek form. It was Joseph, Barsabas, and Justus. Well, this same fellow in the shortened form here, and Joseph, who by the apostles, you see, he had a surname Barsabas before, but now, remember, he was the only one of two qualified uh, to be an apostle. Matthias got it, but uh, this fellow now is surnamed Barsabas. Barnabas, meaning the son of consolation. He could have been an apostle. He could have been elected, but God had something different in mind for him. And we're going to see what uh, that is in just a bit as we go and look through the chronology with regard to James, James the third. Now, we saw this morning that Peter, James, and John were actually the uh, intimate friends of Jesus Christ. During that time, James III was an unbeliever. However, he saw Christ during those 40 days, became a believer, and he was numbered among the brethren uh, at Jerusalem from that time onward. Now, there were some things that happened at Jerusalem during that time. If you will, turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. The whole chapter is taken up with a fellow by the name of Stephen. And Acts chapter 7 brings us to about this point in history. There was another young man by the name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus who endeared himself to the Sanhedrin. He was an up-and-coming Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, brilliant man amongst all of his peers. Uh, he was the cream of the crop, and he decided he's going to wage war on the Jewish believers of Jesus Christ and eradicate any of the Jews that believed on Christ in Jerusalem and in Canaan land, and uh, even those who went um, outside of the land in Gentile territory. Note verse number 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Now who was this? This was Stephen who was saying, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now here we are uh, approximately a year and, uh, and a few months after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Stephen now is giving a witness to the Sanhedrin. One of the people there is Saul of Tarsus. Note verse number uh, 58. And they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen. And Stephen, even as he was stoned, said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, and he fell asleep. Now, what was he saying that made him so mad? He said, I see Jesus Christ standing on the right hand of God in the heavenlies. Now, who was one of the people there voting to cast a stone at Stephen and hearing this man say, I see Jesus Christ? It was Saul. There you go. When Jesus Christ finally appeared to him, he said this, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What does that mean? The pricks of the conscience. Who pricked his conscience? Stephen did. Here was a man who was unjustly murdered by a group of thugs called the Sanhedrin. Saul of Tarsus was in the thick of things with them. And he said, uh, I see Christ. And then he said, Lord, don't lay this into their charge. He forgave them all as he died. And Saul of Tarsus could not get over it. But through his martyrdom, Saul got saved instantly. Jesus appeared and he remembered just a, just a few months prior to that, a man called Stephen saying, I see Jesus at the right hand of God. And all of a sudden in this ball of fire, Jesus is saying, I'm the one you're persecuting. Now, Saul of Tarsus got saved instantly at that moment, but he had some prior preparation of the Holy Spirit through the death of Stephen. But now, we're ahead of our story. Our story is, James is a member of the brethren only at this point. He is not an apostle. We saw that Matthias did great works and miracles. We saw that M Matthias was actually uh, uh, arrested and beaten. You know, that's, <laughs> there's a good point right there. If Matthias was not an apostle... <laughs> They laid their hands on them, brought them to the inner prison, and beat them and said, don't preach any more than in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if he wasn't an apostle, surely he would have said, hey, fellows, whoa, right? And, uh, and uh, James uh, surely should have spoken up before that. He's the one should have, that should have gotten the uh, cat of nine tails. But instead, he did not. It was Matthias who was beaten along with the other 11. James was not. But James was part of the group that despite the persecution in Jerusalem against the church, he stayed there. Now, undoubtedly, he was part of the group that buried Stephen. Now, I'm going to make a point here with regard to James and Paul. Verse 1 of chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. At that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and some other devout men. One of those men was James. James stuck it out. We're talking about James 3. And devout men carried Stephen. We're not told that it was James, but undoubtedly he was there. He knew the circumstances and he knew the young man who instigated Stephen's murder. So, uh, do you imagine before Saul of Tarsus got saved that James had any good feelings with regard to this fellow by the name of, of Saul? He did not. Stephen undoubtedly was a friend of James. How do we know? Come back to chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 1. In those days... When the number of the disciples was multiplied, verse 2, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave God and uh, the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look uh, out among you seven men, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, to appoint over this business. We, verse 4, will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Undoubtedly, James did not want to be what's called the first uh, uh, deacons of the church, those who were, were appointed to distribute the, uh, the goods. Now, what goods? Part of the kingdom message was sell all you have, lay it at the apostles' feet, and live out of a common kitty. That's called kingdom communism. And so uh, the apostles said, we don't want to do that, but we're going to appoint men full of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, verse 5, was appointed. 
But verse 7 tells us, The word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Now, all of a sudden, come to chapter 8. It says, verse 1, just read it, At that time there was a great persecution against the church. Verse number 3, For Saul made havoc of the church entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. But what happened? Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. There was something good that came out of this persecution. What was that? Simply that the people who left Jerusalem began to preach to other people with regard to salvation in Christ. Now, Saul gets saved, and three and a half years after that, he goes to Jerusalem, and guess who he sees? Let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 17, I didn't go to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. I went to Arabia, returned to Damascus. After three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Other the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Now, it says in verse 21, afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Now let's go back to Acts 9. Now, when did Paul get saved? Acts chapter 9. We've already heard, uh, read the record of the chronology. He went into Damascus, into Arabia, back to Damascus, and then down to Jerusalem, a time period, a time frame of three and a half years. He only saw two uh, apostles, as far as, um, you know, uh, what um, they were considering apostles. One of the primary, one of the secondary ascents. Now, verse number 27, he saw someone else. Actually, this guy could have been the 12th apostle. He was not. Verse number uh, 26, let's go there. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, this is three and a half years after he got saved at the beginning of this very chapter, he wanted to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Now, still fresh in their minds. It wasn't all that long ago, just a few years, uh, back to the uh, spring or summer, early summer of 34 AD, when Stephen got stoned by Paul telling the others, you know, cast the stones, let's kill this guy. They didn't believe. They thought that he was just simply uh, disguising himself as a disciple so that he could infiltrate their ranks, find out who's who, and uh, put them in prison. He actually was. Who was the guy who brought him to the apostles? The fellow by the name of the Son of Consolation, the guy that was renamed by the apostles Barnabas, and that's what it means. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. But basically, what two guys of authority at that time did he see? Peter and James. Only two, and then Barnabas was the one who brought him in, the son of consolation. All right, now, and he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. Now, how many days was he there right at this time? Let's go back to Galatians 1. We better fill it in for so we don't... <clears throat> We, we want to get this correct. Verse 18 says, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Right here, when he came back to Jerusalem, he saw James and uh, then also he saw Barnabas. Barnabas brought him in. But something else happened here. There was another person that he saw at this time. James saw Paul, and uh, Paul saw James. But who else did Paul see right here? 
Turn to Acts chapter 22 as you're holding your place. During the 15 days that Paul was there, verse 17. Now this is real important. Why? Because if Paul has this experience and he's down there to relate it to the apostles, just what has happened to him. Barnabas says he's seen the Lord in the way and, uh, and uh, he's gotten this, um, this new revelation of Jesus Christ. During the 15 days he was there, he got another revelation of Jesus Christ. And it came to pass that when I was coming into Jerusalem, even when I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw Christ saying to me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by and consenting to his death. I kept the raiment of them that slew him. He said, Depart, for I will send thee far hence to the Gentiles. Now, who do you suppose that Paul might have told with regard to this particular revelation? James and Peter. Now, James and Peter were two kingdom apostles. I believe that Peter took it well. He probably just dismissed it a little bit, but uh, you will note that three and a half years later, uh, he led Cornelius, an unsaved Gentile of the Italian band, to Christ. Three and a half years later, after his time uh, with Paul, Paul told him, uh, we are changing the program. I've, got a new, I've spent three years in Arabia with Jesus Christ, and he has given me a brand new gospel for the Gentiles. I've seen the Lord, and now he's seen him in the temple saying, get out of here. And Peter says, there, there, we'll, we'll put a cold uh, towel on your head and uh, you know, give you a strong drink and send you back home. But three and a half years later, he saw the sheet from heaven with the unclean animals. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. No, they're, they're common. I don't eat. If I've called it clean, don't call it common. Go to the Gentiles. And so he was convinced of the uh, Pauline message and the change of dispensation. I don't believe that James uh, was all that convinced, nor did he like the Apostle Paul for that reason. Now, we're going to come from this point about... Uh, three and a half years plus to 42 AD, actually just after 41. Let's go to Acts chapter 11. This is just after Peter saw the sheet and led Cornelius and his household to Christ. All right? Acts chapter 11, verse number 18. When they, meaning the apostles and the brethren and the elders at Jerusalem, we find that in verse number 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. When Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. You went into men uncircumcised. And Peter had to explain himself. Guess who was in Jerusalem and guess who he was explaining himself to? James was in Jerusalem at that time. And Peter had to tell him why. Well, why didn't James know? I don't, I don't believe that James was facing up to the fact that there was a change in program. And he was of the circumcision, and he was going to fight for his message, even if it meant fighting the Apostle Paul. We'll see that in a bit. Now, where was Barnabas in all of this? Remember, Barnabas being the son of consolation, he was going to help Paul take the message to the Gentiles. What better man to take the message out to the Gentiles? Remember, Paul had to see the Jews first. And here was a man who was qualified to be a what? An apostle. What better man? He had lived with Christ for three years. He met all of the qualifications. He was there at the day of Pentecost. He was one who sold the land and laid it at the other apostles' feet. That We learned that or there. We could have learned it in Acts chapter 4. And now we find him bringing Paul 
to the apostles, bringing them together. That's the consolation, making a reconciliation of the two. Verse number 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then God, has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life? Answer, yes, he has. Now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Venus and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but Jews only. But some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake to the Grecians. Now here's the difference in the Greek between Hellenes and Hellenistes. Hellenistes are Greek-speaking Jews. Hellenes are Greeks. They are absolutely of the, the Greek race. And they went there, and here is the word, uh, uh, here when it says Grecians, they spoke to Greeks, preaching Jesus Christ. The hand of the Lord was upon them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Tidings of these things came into the ears of the church which is at Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Now, what is the importance here? He sees... Verse number 23, the grace of God. Now you remember, it says that um, the Apostle Paul, when he said after he left for the 15 days here, that he also, even before the other people got there and, and preached to the Greeks, he also preached in what two Gentile areas? Syria and Cilicia, all right? Now, what is the import of this? Antioch is in what country? Syria. Now remember, there are two Antiochs that Paul went to. Antioch in Pisidia and Antioch in Syria. Now that not, should not be hard for us to understand. There is a Brownsville, Texas and a Brownsville, Pennsylvania. All right? If I want to send mail to a Brownsville, I have to designate what state and zip code for it to get there. There's an Antioch in Pisidia. There's an Antioch in Syria. Now, do you know that the first Gentile Christian church was not in Evansville, Indiana, in the United States of America? Do you know where it was? In a place where you could never establish a Christian church like this uh, uh, today. And that's Antioch in Syria. They hate Christ. They hate the Jews. And they hate anybody who stands for them and believes in them. It was in Antioch. Note, then Barnabas... Uh, departed, verse 25, to Tarsus for to seek Saul. He was already from Tarsus going to Cilicia, the area round about Tarsus and Syria. And, uh, and th then these people came up from the south and preached. And now there was a thriving Gentile church in Syria. So it came to pass that they stayed there the whole year and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. But now, follow with me. Something real important here I want you to see. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch. One stood up, Agabus, and said that there was going to be a great dearth or famine throughout all the world. Then the disciples at Antioch, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelt at Judea, which also they did, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, here we are. Peter sees the, mess, uh, the, sees the sheet. Just shortly after that, he comes back to Jerusalem and explains himself. And he says, Look, who was I to, that I could withstand God? This was God's doing. He sent the Holy Spirit before I could lay hands on these people and change things around according to the kingdom message. God is sending the message of grace to the Gentiles. But he should have known that. Paul told him way back here. Both Peter and James heard Paul say, I saw Christ abandoning the temple here. Now, I don't believe James liked that. Anyway, here was the establishment of the first Gentile church. They stayed here a whole year, bringing them to uh, this point. And now we come back to Jerusalem. But guess who is in Jerusalem? Well, James, the brother of John, is there, we know. James the third is there. Peter is there. But who else? Note, which also they did and sent it to the elders in Jerusalem by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now about that time, 
Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with a sword. And because it's, he saw it pleased the Jew, he proceeded to take Peter also. These were the days of unleavened bread. Now, here is when we've said, and we've read it many times, verse number 17 tells us that Peter said at that point, go and show these things to James and to the brethren. There was an opening, a vacancy in one of the thrones with regard to the apostles. James the first here got killed, and James the third replaced him. Now, instead of Peter, James one, and John, it's Peter, James three, and John from this point. But who else was in? You talk about those who want to appoint Paul the 12th of the 13th apostle. Who was in Jerusalem when James the first was killed? Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas who met the qualifications and, and Paul. Certainly they would have been appointed if Paul was the 13th or if Barnabas should have been there instead of James. But James the third took over. Verse number 24. Clear after all of these things happened, the word of God grew and multiplied. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. Okay, so Barnabas and Saul were in Jerusalem when James the first was killed and when James the third took over. They were full well aware of what was going on in Jerusalem. And probably many of the other apostles, for example, Peter, uh, was, was hiding, and Jerusalem was a hotbed for them, and they had to get out of there. Now, from then on, we come to where Barnabas and Saul, or the apostle Paul, had this first Gentile missionary journey. Come to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. He first went to Cyprus. He then was going up into uh, the um, area there of, um, of Galatia and so forth. And he came to some Jews. He went to the Jews first. Barnabas, the son of consolation, brought them together so that Paul could preach the grace message to them and confirm what Peter and the twelve had said about Christ. He had a ministry of confirmation to the Jews, first of all. When they rejected, he had a ministry of condemnation, and then he had a ministry of revelation to the Gentiles. Verse 46. This is happening in 45 AD. Now, verse 46 says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you Jews. That's who they were talking to. But seeing that you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. Verse 49, the word of the Lord was published throughout all of the region. Gentiles were now getting saved. Uh, so Paul was casting away the Jews and turning to the Gentiles. But guess what? The very time that Paul was making this statement, lo, I turn to the Gentiles, guess who's writing a book? James the third. Let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Now, his very first uh, the opening remarks, the very first verse, is going to give us some indication of why James does not like Paul. This is going to take us all the way back to the stoning of Stephen. And we just read the verses. Verse number one. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. When were they scattered abroad? Those that were scattered abroad at the stoning of Stephen. Who scattered the disciples at Jerusalem? Acts chapter 8, Paul made havoc of the church at Jerusalem. He is the one who scattered them abroad. Now, from 34 uh, A.D. all the way to the end of 45 A.D., James is having to write to guess who? The 12 tribes scattered ab abroad. 
Who is guilty? Who is responsible? Who made them leave Canaan land, the land of promise? Who made them leave Jerusalem when they were having such a good time there? Why did they have to leave? It was a man by the name of Paul. And now he's writing the book to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Paul is in Gentile territory going to the Jews first and saying what? Lo, I turn to the Gentiles. You talk about insult to injury. You're talking about rubbing salt into the wound. You talk about hurting. He's writing to the 12 tribes that Saul is responsible for scattering in the first place. And then on his first missionary journey, he tells the Jews, lo, we're turning to the Gentiles. You've judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Now, that is happening there. That is, that is why. Now remember, the Jews that he said that to were unbelieving Jews. But uh, still, at the, at the uh, same time, they were the believing Jews were scattered abroad because of Paul. So James here doesn't like Paul. And he tells them they're going through these tribulations that all started with Paul uh, for a reason. Okay, let's go back to the book of Acts. Let's go back to the book of Acts, and this time we're going to go to chapter number 14. And we're going to move ahead in time to 52... AD. Actually, we're going to pick up something that happened right here in the spring of 46 AD. All right? Stay with me because we're, we're about to get uh, something here as to why James didn't like Paul even more. He went out, out on his um, uh, missionary journey, and as he was coming back in, he was in Lystra, verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came to the city. What happened to Saul when they stoned him at this point? Remember what he said in 2 Corinthians that brings us right here to this uh, Spring of 46 A.D. is right where we are. He was stoned in Lystra, and they thought he was dead, and he said, In the body, out of the body, I don't know. But I knew a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven. Right at this point, Saul of Tarsus was caught up to the third heaven. He came back down, and uh, they thought he was dead. In the body, out of the body, he didn't, he didn't know, but uh, uh, they thought he was dead. But he saw the third heaven, heard unspeakable things, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. All right? He came back down then and rehearsed, verse number 27, when they were come and had gathered the church together, this is the church at Antioch in Syria, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. All right? That brought us here from the... Um, uh, turn of the year here in 47, and they stayed a long time with the disciples there. It had been 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. They say that it was a pro an approximate uh, five-year stay. But now something's going to happen. At this point, there's going to be a question. And guess who is going to be part of solving the question? But it's going to make him mad at Paul. It's going to be James the third. Verse number one. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye can't be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others would go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now, what is going to happen? We're going to see in verse number 13 of chapter 15 that James was the chief spokesman. 
So he went from going an unbeliever to seeing Christ, being one of the brethren, becoming an apostle in the secondary sense, becoming an apostle in the primary sense, actually writing a book to the 12 tribes, and now answering a question down in Jerusalem regarding circumcision. Verse 13, and after they held their peace, James answered, saying, verse number 19, wherefore, James speaking, my sentence is, this is what we're going to do because I'm number one. And he is usurping, actually, Peter's place here. Peter spoke, but it was meaningless. James was the one presiding over the whole meeting. He was the one in charge, not Peter. Now, I want you to see, actually, what was going on. Come to Galatians, and uh, we're going to stay here for just a little while. We're now in the, the spring of the year. And remember, uh, the Apostle Paul gives us the uh, timing. He says when he was in Jerusalem here, 14 years after brings us to the spring of 52 A.D. To a body of men that were going to settle the question of whether or not the uh, Gentiles should be circumcised to be saved. Verse 1, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. I went up by revelation, point. Jesus Christ told him to go there because something is going to happen right here that is really significant. In fact, it, it, it puts uh, a damper on all churches that go out today under the Great Commission. And it's going to happen here in just a second. We're going to have actually two meetings going on at the Jerusalem Council. One is a public meeting, and the other is a private meeting. In Acts chapter 15, Peter spoke first regarding the Gentiles. Then Barnabas and Paul spoke second regarding the Gentiles. Then James said, this is my sentence. I bring it in and this is my judgment and ruling. This is what we're going to do. Now, Paul said some things publicly to the whole group and Paul said some things privately to three men. Who were they? Peter, James 3, and John. Let's look at it. I went up by revelation. Jesus Christ told him to go up and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But now catch this. But privately to them which were of reputation. There was a public meeting where he said certain things regarding the Gentiles. And then there was a private meeting. This is Galatians 2, verse 2. So, he didn't reveal everything. He's in Jerusalem. He didn't reveal everything to the public at that point. However, he wanted those that were of reputation. Who was of reputation? Well, Peter, James, and John. The three names of the Jerusalem church since day one, except that James, one, James 3 replaced James 1. The names are the same, but the one man is different. Okay, now... Verse 6, follow with me, we're about to see something happen here that makes everybody who goes out under the Great Commission absolutely wrong. But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in the Jerusalem church in conference, adding nothing to me. Point. Who was ruling over the Jerusalem church? James 3. What did, who was ruling over the private council? Paul. James 3 said, this is my sentence in public. In private, Paul said, they didn't add anything to me. But, verse 7, contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of uncircumcision was committed to me as the gospel of circumcision was to Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles, then James, Cephas, and John. What James are we talking about? 
James 3, absolutely. He was one of the three power members called the pillars of the church of reputation in the Jerusalem church. He was the one presiding over the meeting. He was the power elder, uh, so to speak. But in private, Paul said, they couldn't tell me anything. However, I told them a few things. That gospel which I was preaching uh, uh, to the Gentiles, and I brought them, just, just reminded James and Peter of what Jesus Christ did in abandoning the temple here. Fourteen years later, I come back and, I, and I'm reminding them and bringing them up to date because uh, I've had a whole lot of things happen to me. Christ has appeared to me and I've been caught up to the third heaven. And, and just about six years later, he comes to Jerusalem there and he says, I'm the apostle now. Yes, while we're in Jerusalem, I'll let you guys have your reputation. But in private, you are going to obey me. Now, what did they do? When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they should stay with the circumcision. Right there, publicly, things are still hunky-dory with the people in the uh, Jerusalem church. But privately, those that were the power members of that church had an agreement that they would not go any farther than the borders of the promised land in dealing with what message they had. And Paul would go, um, Paul would go to the uh, Gentiles and they would stay there with the Jews. Now we're just about out of time, but um, Let's see. Let's let's go back. Let's go back to um, Acts. Just about out of time. Acts, chapter twenty-one. The remaining moments we have, we'll we'll come back to this probably uh, this coming Wednesday night and try to finish this up. Something that uh, James did is real sneaky with regard to Peter. But you will remember that James knew about Paul's going into the temple. And the fact that he saw Jesus Christ abandoning it. Years later, Paul comes back down to Jerusalem. And guess where James is going to tell Paul to go? Verse number 17, Acts 21. When we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. The day following, Paul went in with us unto James. The elders were present. When he had uh, saluted them, he declared what God was doing among the Gentiles. But when they heard it, instigated by James, we'll see this Wednesday night. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord. But they said, brother, see how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. They're all zealous of the law. They're informed of thee that you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they should not circumcise their children and walk after the customs. What is this therefore? We've got a vow. Now that vow had entailed him going into the temple. Now James knew exactly what he was doing. Good way to slit the throat and silence the tongue of Paul. Go into the temple. He, Paul had made, this was at the day of Pentecost, Paul had made so many enemies that eventually somebody was going to recognize him, and they did. It says in verse number 27, please follow along, we're just about ready to stop. Verse 27, when the seven days were ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Men of Israel, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people, against the law, and against this place. And furthermore, he's brought Greeks into the temple and polluted it. So that, uh, verse number 30, all the city was moved and ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. Point. Paul should never have been in the temple to begin with. 
because Christ said, I'm abandoning the temple. But James knew what he was doing because he knew of all the enemies Paul had, and the place for him to be spotted was where? Was the best place for him to be spotted? Right in the temple itself. And James said, uh, I got so excited, I dropped my pen. James said to Paul, hey, go into the temple. And just exactly what James thought happened. He predicted that Paul would be caught. And they shut the doors behind him. That special place to Paul, the temple, would never be frequented by him again. Now, I just want to tell you that um, God is always fair. I'm going to tell you how James 3 died. The temple was special to James as well. But because he did that to Paul, the scribes and the Pharisees in 62 AD started chasing James. James hid himself at the south end of the temple. It's where the pinnacle of the temple is, where, where Satan said to, for Jesus to jump off. It's about 500 feet down to the Kidron Valley. Now, at that end, the scribes and the Pharisees caught James III. And you know what they did to him? Pitched him off the cliff at the temple, the very place, knowing everything that happened to, to Paul regarding the temple and knowing that he sent him right in there and what was going to happen to him. At that very spot, they pitched him off the cliff. 